All right, so this is part two of the 201 class, and we're going to talk about the last two habits. And I don't think these two take quite as long, but they do have some very important parts to them, and these are the things that will make a difference. Let's start with prayer right now. Whatever you're doing, settle down for just a minute. Maybe get your drink or, or take a pause this, this video. Here we go. Father, thank you so much for the habits of the Christian life. May we live them in our daily lives. Father, bless each one that's watching this, each one that's participating. Lord, maybe even somebody just stumbled across this. I pray that you would use this in Jesus' name. Amen. My prayer is that these habits... Now, the, the habit number three is the one that people get angry about the most. And uh, I'm going to give you some things. I want you to listen through what I'm about to say and look at God's word and compare it about what I'm saying to what God's word says. And I think that you'll have a hard time disagreeing with it. And I've seen God bless people so often when they do this. Here we go. Okay. And here we go. <laughs> Honoring God with everything. So here's some principles from scripture. Remember early on, I talked about in the last session, being a steward is the idea of taking care of somebody else's property. God has caused all of us to be a steward. In Galatians 6, 7, it says, don't be deceived. God can't be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. So if you sow words of anger, you're going to reap anger. If you sow words of kindness, you will eventually reap kindness. Ephesians 5.16 says, make the best use of time. Why? Because the days are evil. And then in 1 Corinthians 16.2, on the first day of every week, each of you should set aside a sum of money, keep it with your income. So here are three principles, and we're going to look at all of these. And how do we honor God with our time? How do we honor God with our money? The two main spendable resources in life are time and money. We make a difference in eternity when we invest our time and money in things that matter in eternity. Therefore, we must have a plan for our time and our finances. You know, there's a lot of people who say that God is priority in their life, but they never go out of their way to do anything with their time, or they never go out of their way to do anything with their money to do anything for God. Your life shows by how you spend your time and how you spend your money, your priorities. Now, here's six rules of time management. Let's talk about time first. First of all, time is fleeting. Time goes away quickly. Teach us to number our days that we may, may gain a heart of wisdom. Number two, time is valuable. You know, don't just waste your time because every second matters. Number three, time brings change. There's a time for everything, a season for every activity under heaven. Listen, you can't, at the end of your life, Wish that you had spent more dinners with your family and sit down and eat for three weeks together. You can only do that one day at a time. One day at a time is the only time that you can look at somebody and care about them and listen to what they say. One day at a time is how often you, you can't exercise all at once and build muscle. You can't spend time with somebody just on your vacations and think you're going to have a good relationship with them. You can't, at the end of your life, say, well, once my kids are grown up, I'm going to serve. Once my kids have gotten out of college, I'm going to serve. Uh, uh, I'm going to serve when I feel like, listen, we've got to serve and do and listen to people when the opportune time comes. Number four, what you do today matters tomorrow. Proverbs 6.6, 6, go to the ant, you sluggard, consider its ways and be wise. Ants prepare, and many times we don't. Number five, Commit to things that matter. It's a trap to dedicate something rashly and only later to consider one vows. Listen, what matters in life? What matters around you? And are you spending time on things that matter? Number six, what do you want to accomplish? If you want to accomplish something, start today. This is why you should have a quiet time every day because one of the things that does is that builds that character in your life over time. Just like building a muscle, your prayer life, your, your awareness and your understanding of scripture grow over time, little by little. Now, here's some tips. Make a schedule. I like an old-fashioned day timer, but I'm switching over to a digital calendar. On my phone, I've got a um, uh, Google Calendar, and it's got all my stuff in it, and I make lists all the time. So make a schedule. List priorities. Make time for them. There are certain things that pop up on my calendar every Thursday or every Tuesday that remind me of what's important that day. I even have people that I'm supposed to call every other uh, Thursday, and it reminds me, make time for a quiet time. We talked about that already. Plan special time with family, with friends, with others, and then make time to serve others. You know, there's people who will find time for every social activity, but won't find time to invest in people for God's kingdom. 
at our church, we ask all of our members to serve on some type of team. Serve somewhere. Why? Because even the little that you do, whether it's greet at a door, whether it's help with the children, whether it's help in children's church, help with the youth ministry, uh, uh, do the soundboard, uh, work with the video presentation, uh, uh, help um, clean the building uh, during the week, um, help with the, uh, we're getting ready to restart our uh, uh, kitchen team, help with the kitchen team, help with the special events, um, help with our uh, A team that is just starting up. All of these things are ways you invest in things that in some cases it seems like it has. What is, what is mowing the grass of the church? What is pulling weeds of the church have anything to do? Because there are people that when they show up for church, you're making an impression on them that God cares for them and that they matter. When you say hello to somebody, hello, I don't know why you'd say it that way, but when you say hi to somebody, you're showing them that they matter to you. So we have to serve other people. And we ask that everybody who's a part of our church serves other people. Make time for church services. Church services are a time to connect with others. And then finally, make time for a small group. I encourage you to be in a small group, a small Bible study. We'll be talking about that. And then look for those things that matter. Now, what does the Bible teach about tithing? Tithing, the tithe means a tenth part. And people often mix up tithe and offering. So a tithe is a tenth part. It is giving the first 10 or the 10% above of my income. Okay, it's so the first 10%. And an offering is anything above my tithe. It's anything above my tithe. That may be a blank in your book. Why should I tithe? Here's what the Bible says. The tithe, first of all, you need to understand, existed before the law existed. Uh, Melchizedek, Abraham, or Abram at that time, gave a tenth of everything in Genesis 14, 20. That was before the law. So the tithe is not just, every once in a while somebody say, well, that's an Old Testament law thing. No, the tithe was actually before the law. And in the New Testament, it even talks about how we're God's first fruits. Uh, God loves us that much. Two, because God commanded it in Leviticus 27, 30. A tenth of all you produce is the Lord's and it's holy. Number three, because Jesus encouraged it. He could have stopped it. Jesus could have said, hey, you shouldn't tithe. You should quit. No, he says you should tithe and you shouldn't leave the more important things done undone already. Number four, it demonstrates that God's first place. When you have to set money aside and the first part goes to God, it shows that he's first place, Deuteronomy 14, 23. Number five, it reminds me that all I have was been given by God. Always remember the Lord, your God, who gives you the ability to plant. So he gives you the ability. Number six, it expresses gratitude to God. <clears throat> Number seven, tithing, give God a chance to prove he exists and wants to bless you. I just talked to somebody last week who said to me, you know, Eric, I really, after taking the 201 class, was convicted about giving and I decided we're going to do it. And so we began to work towards giving and now we tithe. And she said to me, it is amazing how much God has blessed us in so many ways since we tithe. I wish everybody could have that lesson. Malachi 3.10 says, bring your whole tithe to the storehouse. And it's the only time God says this. He says, test me in this, says the Lord, and see if I will throw open the floodgates. Number eight, God wants us to be leaders in giving. Second Corinthians, I want you to be leaders also in the spirit of cheerful giving. We're going to talk about what it means to give cheerfully. Now, the first thing I would encourage you to do if you're going to give is to start a budget. Now, this came from Dave Ramsey's budget book. This is a very simple one. And Dave Ramsey starts with the tithe. If you'll notice that in the left-hand corner, you start there. Now, when I talked to my mentor, Dave Daniel, years ago, he said when he first started learning to tithe, he said, honestly, because of the way our bills were, if I had tithed, we would have had to lose our house. <laughs> but as he learned to tithe, he, what he did is he started with 2%. He said, I'm going to start with 2%. And then the next year he went to 4 or 6%. I don't remember the percentages now. And after three or four years, they were up to 10% and God provided for them the whole time, his whole life. But you go through and make your list. You'll find that you may be wasting money in some areas and yet you're saying, I can't give to God. And yet you're wasting money on things that really aren't important in life. Now, why does God want me to give? Here's seven benefits for you. Number one, it, giving makes me like Jesus. In John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, what did he do? He gave. Number two, giving draws me closer to God. Where your treasure is, there's your heart also. So it's wild. When you give, you notice something. If you put money somewhere, you pay attention to it. Number three, giving's the antidote to selfishness. Listen, in our society, this is huge. People find money for the things they want. I cannot tell you how many times over the years, people have told me they don't have anything and then they go on a cruise or they don't have anything and they go on a huge vacation. And I think, well, 
you just have a different priority than living. <laughs> You'd rather take vacations than pay your medical bills. And the truth is we have got to prioritize what God wants us to do. First Timothy, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant or put hope in wealth, which is uncertain, but put their hope in God who provides us with everything for our enjoyment. You hear that? He provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Listen, here in America, no matter whether we're the richest or the poorest person in the world, we are so wealthy. So many of us have one of these, a grill. You know, in some countries, they can't even imagine getting to cook like we do. This, this we don't even have to have. It's extra. So many extra things. I think I've got a boxing thing over there. There's, you know, we have so much. And yet so often we say we don't have anything. He gave it to us for what reason? For our enjoyment. And then he says, command them to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they take hold of the life that is truly life. Number four, giving strengthens my face, faith. Because when you have to trust God with all your heart and lean not on your understanding, honor the Lord by giving the first part of your income. In verse nine, it says, and he'll fill your barns to overflowing. Number five, giving's an investment in eternity. Listen, if you want, Peter Lord, you say, if you want a blue chip stock, you invest in the kingdom. Listen, when you give money to our church or when you give money to a kingdom investment, maybe it's missions, maybe it's uh, uh, in a way that, that brings the gospel to so other people can find out about Jesus. When you make those investments, you're helping people to find their way home to Christ. Our church's whole purpose is to help people find their way to Christ. This next weekend, I'll be baptizing people, people who made life changes recently who said, I no longer am going to go the way I've always gone. I'm going with God. And those are people that one day in heaven will be sitting at the table. And because of your gifts, we're able to reach people for the kingdom. First Timothy 6, 18 and 19. Give happily to those in need. Be ready to share whatever God has given you. By doing this, you're storing up real treasures for yourself in heaven. It's the only safe investment for eternity. I love that translation. Number six, giving blesses me. It's a selfish reason, right? Not really. A giving man himself will be blessed. Listen, it's blessing when you give. Number seven, giving brings me joy. There's more happiness in giving than receiving. And we all know that at Christmas time now. Now, what should I tithe? The tithe should be the per first part, not the leftovers. Most people want to give once everything else is paid. Honor the Lord by giving him the first part of your income. How do you do that? You got to make a budget. You got to see where the money's going. So where should I give my tithe? The Bible says, Malachi 3.10, bring your whole tithe to my storehouse. So that's where you're fed spiritually. And then when should I tithe? Regularly. You plan it. In 1 Corinthians 16, 2, here was a suggestion on the first day of every week. Set aside some of what you've earned and give it as an offering. The amount depends on how much the Lord has helped you to earn. Now, here's giving me the right attitudes. This is the most important. Number one, give willingly. 1 Corinthians 9, 7, the second verse there. Each one should give what he's decided in his heart to give. Not reluctantly or under compulsion. Give cheerfully. Uh, uh, it actually kind of means hilariously. So I'll never forget years ago at a church I was at, the pastor said, I want you to laugh before you give. Give till, it, till you hurt. <laughs> but 2 Corinthians says God loves a cheerful giver. And then finally, give generously. In 2 Corinthians, here's a great example of that. They gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing the service. They saw it as a privilege. 2 Corinthians, remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will reap generously. Now, here's some of Dave Ramsey advice. Dave Ramsey helps you to do a, uh, a budget. He says, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. If you're having a hard time managing your finances, I encourage you. We have Dave Ramsey resources, but you can also get online and even take his class online now. You save, you spend, and give. My big three principles. Most people forget about the giving part because they think, I only scream, save, save, save. Giving liberates the soul of the giver. You never walk around feeling badly. And then he says, no one's ever become poor by giving. I love this quote from Dave Ramsey. If you can't live off 90% of your income, you can't live off 100%. It doesn't require a miracle for you to get through the month. I think if you sit down and look at your budget, you'll see you can make it while giving at least 10%. Read the Bible, take from it what you will. And if you tithe, do it out of love for God, not guilt. I love that. All Dave Ramsey stuff. Now here's some thoughts. We believe that all we have is God's. And these are from me, okay? All that we have is God's and we're called to be a steward. So everything I have is God. So how does he want me to use it? God blesses as we give. Tithes and offerings were practiced in the early church. Every once in a while, somebody would come to me and say, well, that tithing, 
is Old Testament. And I say, well, the early church didn't believe it was Old Testament. Believers need to grow in their giving as they discover that God blesses their giving. And here's the deal. As we learn to give, we should give even more as we discover what it means to give to others. And there's different ways to give. We encourage our members to do plan their giving, to give consistently, and then prioritize giving. You want to give towards the tithe and beyond. Maybe you start, hey, listen, maybe all you can do is, is plan 1%. Then start with 1%. Set aside that amount every week and make it a practice to give. I want you to know something from me, though. I have no idea what anyone in our church gives. So if you're watching this thing, well, the pastor knows I'm watching this and he knows they give. I have no idea. The only time I know what anybody gives is if somebody comes to me and says, pastor, I want you to know I gave a check this week. Or, pastor, I want you to know I haven't been giving. Uh, that's probably more common. And I'm so glad the dog's barking. Montana. She just wanted to emphasize that point. Now, the pastors don't know what anyone gives. The second thing, the members of the church support the church through serving and giving. I also want you to know, if you want your ch children to be generous, then teach them to give and serve others. If you don't teach them by example, if you never serve in church, if you never go to church and you want your kids to live that way, they're just not going to. So don't expect it. Second Corinthians 8, 5, they first gave themselves to the Lord. We're going to talk a little bit about time here. Failing to plan is planning to fail. Remember, have a plan for your time and for your money. Planning helps set priorities. When you do a budget, it sets priorities. When you do that calendar we talked about, set priorities for your life. Now, here's a commitment prayer. Let's stop and pray this real quick. Father, I know you love me and want what's best for me. I recognize that all I have or ever will have comes from you. I'm more interested in pleasing you than having more possessions. I want you to have first place in my life, and I'm willing to begin tithing as I've learned in your word. Out of gratitude for all you've done for me and expectation you'll continue to provide for me, I commit myself to returning at least the first 10% of all I earn back to you. I want to begin investing in eternity. Lord, I commit my time and my finances to you. Help me to remain faithful to this commitment. In Jesus' name, amen. Habit four, fellowship. Listen, I don't know how to emphasize this enough. In our society that's gone all digital, I'm even doing this class digital now. You need time with people. I don't care if it's just one other person. Now, I know you have your spouse, and I want to encourage you. If you have a spouse that you spend time with, that's wonderful. But you ought to have at least one other person that you're fellowshipping with to get a depth of the Christian life. That's participating in God's family. In Hebrews 10.25, early church, let us not give up the habit of meeting together as some are doing. Instead, let us encourage each other. All the more as we see the day approaching. I'm going to take a drink. Here's why fellowship is important. Here's what it says in the Bible. I belong in God's family with other believers. Ephesians 2.19, let us do good to all people, especially, excuse me, Galatians, who, those who belong to the family of believers. Ephesians 2.19, you're a member of God's very own family. And if you're Italian, you're a member of God's very own family. <laughs> I don't know how to do an Irish accent, even though I'm Irish. And you belong in God's household with every other Christian. Romans 12, 5. So in Christ, we who are many form one body and each member, listen, belongs to all the others. Number two, I need encouragement to grow spiritually. You can get really stagnant if you don't spend time with other believers talking about God's word. Even being in a small Bible study, not just watching online, but where you participate with other people can change your life. I have one that, that meets right now every Sunday night, uh, uh, most Sunday nights, and we meet at five o'clock and we have one there. There's other Bible studies that go on. There's ladies Bible studies that go on. I encourage you, if you don't have one or a good time one, you can start one. You can start with one other person. We'll give you the materials to help you start a Bible study. Why? Because I need encouragement to grow spiritually. And then number three, I need accountability to grow spiritually. You need people to come alongside of you to encourage you. Galatians 6, 1 and 2 says it this way. Brothers, if someone's trapped in some sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. And a little bit later, it says, carry one another's burdens. And in this way, you'll fulfill the law of Christ. Number four. Christ is present when we fellowship together. Isn't that awesome? Wherever two or three have come together in my name, I'm right there, Matthew 18, 20. Number five, there is power when people pray together. Whenever two of you on earth agrees about anything to pray for it, it'll be done by my Father in heaven. I love one of the first things we do when our group comes together is we meet together and we talk about needs of each other 
And then we take time to pray for each other. Before we even do any questions, before we go through scripture, we take time to pray for each other. And listen, we're here for each other. The other thing about group is we don't just meet on Sundays. If somebody in our group has a need, we talk during the week, we text, we email, we check on each other. Number six, fellowship's a witness to the world. John 17, 21, my prayer is for all of them that they'll be of one heart and mind so the world will believe that you sent me. Number seven, I am obligated to every other Christian. God has given you special abilities. Be sure to use them to help each other. First Peter 4, 10. First Corinthians 12, there are different kinds of service to God. To God. Together, you form the body of Christ and each one of you, listen, is a necessary part of it. God has given you gifts that no one else has. And it could be that you notice something that's not happening at church, and maybe you're the one that needs to do it. It could be that God has provided you to pick up that piece. At Surfside, we ask all of our members to join a team, any team. Listen, not only do we have small groups, we also have teams that serve together, and that way you connect with others. We'll talk more about spiritual gifts in the 301 class, which I've not taught in a while, but um, 301 class is a spiritual gifts class. How have you been gifted? What is it in your life that God has gifted you with? We ask all of our members, join us in to connect with others. Now, why should we serve together? Because when you serve together, whether it's on the kitchen team, whether it's with the sound team, whether it's with the nursery team or the children's team or the youth team or the uh, uh, action team, the A team, or a music team, any of those teams, we have fellowship, humility. It honors God. It makes a difference in eternity. Scripture commands it. It removes pride. When you have to get with other people, you have to humble yourself. It helps us grow spiritually and spiritual maturity. By the way, we will be taking a mission trip soon. That's another team you can join. And you really get to know those people when you take an in-country mission trip. Eventually, I want to have an out-of-country mission trip, but that's not happening this year, but maybe next year. The Christian who is not committed to a group of believers for praying, sharing, and serving so that he is known as he knows is not I don't know why I have that extra sentence there. It's not an obedient Christian. He is not in the will of God. However vocal he may be in his theology, he's not obeying the Lord. We need each other. Here's some one another's of fellowship. Serve one another. Accept one another. Forgive one another. By the way, if you get to know people, you have to forgive them. We're all imperfect. You have to forgive you. Greet one another. That's why we have greeters, right? (laughs) Bear one another's burdens. Be devoted to one another. Honor one another. Teach one another. Submit to one another. Encourage one another. And there's a bunch more of one another passages that you cannot grow and practice unless you're in a group of people. Now, the only way a large church, and listen, you may think, well, our church isn't that large. Listen, if there are 50 people at a church, it's a large church. You cannot get to know 50 people. You can't share your heart. Well, you shouldn't with 50 people. A crazy person shares their heart with everybody, okay? You got to have a close group of friends. So we have to grow larger and smaller as a church at the same time. And I believe that every member should be a part of a small group, whether it's a service team, a Bible study. The best would be if you're in both a service team and in a Bible study. If you look at Acts 5.42, they met day after day in the temple courts and from house to house. So they have two types of church meeting in scripture. The large group, they met in the temple courts, and then they went from house to house. That's a small group. And by the way, I even encourage people, you ought to have one or two other people you meet with where you can really share your heart. And I'll show you how to do that. Here's the, some examples below of the churches that met in homes. Now, what's the purpose of our small groups? Teaching, fellowship, communion. This is all from Acts 2. Prayer, support, social. It's okay to be social. Let's go to eat together. Singing and praising God. Isn't that awesome? And then outreach, reaching out together. We do more together than we could ever do alone. Now, here's a simple fellowship plan. Let's say you can't be in a small group, but maybe you could call a buddy and this could be something you could do. I had a group of two men, three men for years. We met and we did something called SOAP. We met, I can't remember what morning, I think it was Friday mornings at like five or 5.30 in the morning and we did SOAP. S stood for scripture. So we would say, what are you studying in the Bible? And so they would talk. Each of us would go around and talk. And then we'd do, oh, who are you reaching out to? And we would talk about who we're reaching out to, whether it's a neighbor or a friend or somebody at a restaurant. Maybe it could be the waiter, uh, whoever it was we reach out to. Accountability. Hey, where's your struggle? How's your family? How's your thought life? Uh, are you struggling with depression, discouragement? Accountability. Are you becoming more loving, more hateful? You know, what are you doing? And then finally, pray. How can I pray for you? And usually we didn't even have to ask how to pray for each other because by the time we had done SOA, it was easy to pray for each other. 
So take that. Here's another one you can do. Um, oh, by the way, so here's how to make things right with others. So, so that soap group is a great way. If you don't have a small group, get with somebody who's your buddy and, and start a soap group. It's a great group to do. Now, how to make things right with others. This came from Peter Lord's 2959. Um, this is a great resource. It should be in your book. If it's not, let me know and I'll send this to you. When you're within the family of God, if you're the one who's done wrong, you have to make it right with God, make it right with the offended, and then make necessary restitution. That's if you've done something wrong. If you've been offended by others, first you have to seek reconciliation. Maybe, you know, somebody hit your car or something, but examine yourself to see if you contributed to it first. Too many times people go to somebody else when the truth is they're just as guilty. So be wise. Have I done something that's caused you to be angry or frustrated or irritated with me instead of going to them and saying you did something wrong and then do all you can to try to make things right if possible. When you're the Christian that sees a brother sending, pray. You need to be careful and led by the Spirit. We are not supposed to be the Holy Spirit for other people. However, there's a time that we have to say, hey, I'm really concerned. You know, one of the things I had to sit down with a guy one day and say is, hey, I'm really concerned. It seems like you're drinking a lot of alcohol and I'm worried about you becoming an alcoholic. Is there anything I can do to help you? And um, his reaction was really good, but that's not always true. So you have to pray. You have to look in the mirror, make sure you're being obedient to God, not just trying to control somebody or tell somebody else what to do. And then approach them with love. Your whole idea is to, for them to have a relationship with God, not for you to be justice. Now, if it's somebody outside of God's family, if you're the offender, you do the same thing. You make it right. But if you're offended, you have to forgive. They don't have to act like a Christian. They're not a Christian. So if they're not a Christian, don't expect them to act like a Christian. But you can pray, but you don't need to correct them. Now, you need to understand this doesn't include abuse. There is abuse that should be reported to authorities. If there's abuse that happens at our church, you should tell me so I can call the authorities. We have had to call the police on different events. That's very different than church discipline. And we believe in that type of discipline also. Anything stolen should be returned. Lies confessed. Gossip must be repented of. Um, by the way, don't confess things to people they don't know about either. I, I, that's one of the things that people make mistake with. They sometimes confess to somebody, I've hated you for years, and the person didn't know anything about it. Here's some wrong approaches. I'm sorry, but if you'd not done this, uh, a better is, I'm sorry, forgive me, but not, I'm sorry, forgive me without being specific. Forgive you for what? So I'm sorry I talked that way. Forgive me for my attitude. And then right approaches. I was wrong what I said or what I did, and can you forgive me? Now, here's a 201 commitment form. It's in your book or it's put in your book or in your folder. This is not a legal document. If you didn't receive one, let me know. We'll email you one. And if you have any questions about this class, send me a note. Thank you for participating. Let me close in prayer. Father, thank you for everyone who listened to this whole class, who went through every moment and learned the four habits of the Christian life. Father, I pray that we would learn to spend time in your word. Help us to go deep in your word so you can fill us. Lord, help us to learn how to pray. Lord, how to pray and, and so that we can hear your voice and walk clearly. Father, teach us how to be good stewards of our time and of our money. Father, if we're wasting either of those, just convict us and make it right in our hearts. And Father, finally, help us to fellowship with one another. In a world that's pulling away from each other, help us to love one another so that others see that you're real. We thank you for these moments in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for watching this class. We love you guys. Any questions or anything, you feel free to send me an email, a note, anything else. Take care.